Welcome to Efforts in the Works to Ease a Strained Healthcare Workforce. We know the COVID-19 pandemic has placed an incredible strain on our healthcare workforce, from physicians and nurses to direct care workers. It's also highlighted issues of staffing shortages, low wages, burnout, and mental distress. As the second wave prompts record case reports, many on the front lines continue to struggle. What's being done to ease the burden and ensure that providers can continue to care for the sickest patients? I'm really pleased to introduce our three experts. Uh, first, Karen Schwartz. Uh, she is Director of Clinical and Educational Programs, John Hopkins School of Medicine Mood Disorder Center. Cinda Rushton, the Ann and George L. Bunting Professor of Clinical Ethics, Berman Institute of Bioethics at Hopkins School of Nursing, and Robert Espinoza, Vice President of Policy for PHI, a nonprofit focused on the direct care workforce. And just a reminder, we're going to hold questions for all the panelists uh, until everyone has presented, but feel free to send them in any time during the presentation. And uh, we'll be doing breakout rooms following the discussion, so please hang around for that. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Schwartz. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's great to have this opportunity to share with you some of the concerns I think we all have for healthcare workers and the added stress that everyone is experiencing during the pandemic. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the phases of disaster response to put what I'm going to talk about in context. And then I'll talk about some of the sources of stress and potential consequences for healthcare workers with a, an extra focus on physicians because my colleague is going to be thinking and talking more about uh, how this is affecting nurses. And then discuss a little bit about our coordinated continuum of support at Johns Hopkins, which I think can serve as a model. If we look at this reaction to the, a disaster, this was a model developed by George Everly and other colleagues at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Everly is a disaster psychiatry international expert. And what you can see in this chart is along the y-axis, we have someone's psychological well-being. And then it goes through the different phases of disaster. And I think we've seen this so far in this current disaster, where initially, there is a drop coming out of the impact and the sort of the sense of feeling overwhelmed last March. And then there's a rallying. There's a heroic response and then a honeymoon phase where people feel like they have met the challenge. And then well-being sinks into a disillusionment phase. And the challenge we have right now is that we are going into the disillusionment phase and are firmly there and are about to have the second wave, really, I fear, overwhelm us. And so we have exhausted, stressed, and just done in healthcare workers that are now facing a second wave coming. The other problem is that this is a disaster of uncertainty, where we are dealing with morbidity, duration, and ambiguity. We are now finally deciding that maybe we don't have to worry about every you know, piece of food that comes from the grocery store, but there's still a lot of unknowns about what kind of danger a healthcare provider has by going to work and caring for patients. And it's with disasters of uncertainty that we tend to see the greatest psychological consequences. These are well known to everyone, some of the, the stress sources that people are having, and I have them in three big categories. The first is from the infection itself. We don't know that much about this virus even now. We know a lot more than we did last March and with some very exciting news about vaccine development and some development of treatments, I don't think people are quite as overwhelmed or feeling that they have nothing to offer patients or that if they themselves were ill that there would be nothing to help them, but there's still worry. And I think we don't know much about the long-term consequences of the virus for health and I'll make, a, as a psychiatrist, I'll make a particular underscore that we do not know about the long-term mental health consequences for those who are infected. A recent study was showing that it was 20% of those who have had COVID-19 that were later diagnosed with some form of psychiatric illness. As far as professional, I'm going to defer to Dr. Rushton because she's going to talk about some of the uncertainty and the problems that come out of 
maybe not being able to do everything you might like or being faced with very difficult challenges. But I can tell you from speaking with colleagues and providing them with psychiatric care, this has been a remarkably challenging way to practice. We are used to being able to know more and do more. And so I think that this has been an exhausting time to be in healthcare. And then finally, we're dealing with the fact that individuals, nurses, physicians, other, other healthcare workers are having to do all of this where they are feeling a disconnection from their family. I personally have elderly parents. The number of times that I've been able to visit them in the last you know, eight months is so reduced from the usual. We're about to face the holidays. There are all these challenges that are going on, as well as some in healthcare actually facing difficulties with furloughs and actually job loss. One of the earliest studies that actually was large looking at healthcare workers and their psychiatric and psychological uh, fallout was done in China where they had over 1,200 healthcare workers, a mix of nurses and physicians from 34 different hospitals. And at each hospital, they identified either a frontline ward or not. So some were the fever clinics or COVID wards and some were not, so they could make comparisons. And they did standard measures looking at depression, anxiety, insomnia, and distress. So if we look at the severity of depression, and this is with the PHQ-9 or the patient health questionnaire, the basic break point where you would be very worried about a positive score being associated with major depression or a serious form of depression here would fall into the moderate and severe category. And so what you can see are two things. One is there are quite high rates looking at, you know, essentially uh, 13 or 15 percent of physicians and nurses that were meeting that criteria, much higher than you would expect in, the, in a typical time. And also that the rates are higher for the nurses, which I think surprises no one and also relates to the fact that the rates are much higher in frontline healthcare workers. And so, you know, again, I think that there is understandable recognition that nurses and physicians have different patterns of interactions with patients and certainly have different patterns of exposure. We see similar things with anxiety. Again, here, moderate and severe would be at a level on the anxiety scale, the generalized anxiety disorder scale, that would be concerning for having a serious anxiety disorder. And again, the rates are slightly higher for the nurses, but significant for both and much higher for frontline healthcare workers. A similar study that was done in Italy after their large wave in the spring showed that a very high percent of healthcare workers were reporting PTSD symptoms as well as symptoms of depression, anxiety, and having high stress, maybe not insomnia. Now, I do think that that speaks to the fact that people are physically exhausted. They're just exhausted from the work. And I don't think it's surprising that there are higher rates for women, probably looking at the fact that, that there's a gender difference um, most places in physicians versus nurses, frontline healthcare workers and younger healthcare workers. And we've certainly seen that in other disaster responses. Those who have not in their life yet faced something very stressful, perhaps don't have the same kind of coping skills to deal with it. In this survey, there were roughly a third of the participants who were physicians, a third who were nurses, and a third who were other healthcare workers. And I wanna put this just in the context that we are having extraordinarily high rates of anxiety and depression throughout this country. This is the pulse survey that's been done. It uses the PHQ-2 or a two question depression screen, and then also use a, a short anxiety screen. And if you look, comparing the same measures from 2019 to July of 2020, we have a tripling or quadrupling of the rates of anxiety and depression at a level that would be concerning for potential underlying illnesses. And so this is what we're facing. And this is what people are facing with their own family members as well. <clears throat> 
One other study I'd like to review briefly before talking about what we're doing at Johns Hopkins is a, a national survey that was a collaboration between the CDC, Melbourne University, and Harvard University. And with a web-based sample, they looked at over 5,400 individuals, and this was in the last week of June. In the questions they asked, they included the PHQ-2 and the GAD-2, the same surveys that were that were included for the Pulse survey of the CDC. And then importantly to me, they also asked very specific questions about substance use and suicidal ideation. There's a lot of information in this survey, um, which I'll, I, many of you I'm sure have seen from the MMWR, but we'll make sure it's in the, in the materials that are available to you. The thing that I wanna highlight relates to employment status. Other results of this study demonstrate that young adults, so 18 to 24, have particularly high rates of depression, anxiety, substance misuse, and suicidal ideation. But if you look at the depressive symptoms as relate to employment status, there's something really interesting. They have employed and unemployed at essentially the same rate but then they further broke down employed into essential and non-essential workers. Now, this is a broad range of essential workers. It's not only healthcare workers, but certainly includes a large number of healthcare workers. So the exclusive categories, essential, non-essential, unemployed, and retired are mutually exclusive. So if you look at it that way, there are obviously the highest rates of depressive symptoms among those who are essential workers. You'll also find that that is the group where a quarter essentially are saying that they started or increased substance use during the time of the pandemic. Very concerning. And maybe most concerning, certainly most concerning to many of us, is that 20% plus are reporting that they've considered suicide. So if we think about suicide, I'm sorry, let me, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Johns Hopkins. I've had the great pleasure of being part of an effort throughout Johns Hopkins Medicine that is trying to organize an integrated, complementary, and multidisciplinary approach. Our focus is to try to have excellent support services for all healthcare workers at Johns Hopkins and all staff, not simply healthcare workers, but with a particular focus on providing support to frontline healthcare workers. These are my colleagues, and they represent a, a number of different programs, the Office of Wellbeing, the RISE program, which is a terrific program that takes volunteers who are trained onto units to talk with staff who have had very distressing or upsetting experiences, our employee assistance program, my support, the spiritual care department, others from leadership and nursing and psychiatry, as well as programs like Health, Healthy at Hopkins and uh, consultation with Dr. Everly, a disaster psychiatry expert. So this has been a tremendous group where we're trying to do a number of things, but mainly make sure that all working at Hopkins are able to easily access services that are available. One thing that I have been a part of is the Department of Psychiatry's response, which has had three or four different elements. One is to have one of our colleagues offer Monday through Friday, daily mindfulness meditation, stress reduction services. So something that's easy, you can just zoom in and join or not join depending on your schedule. The other is to organize support groups that are broadly for a whole group of, of uh, healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, and others. And then we also have developed the COVER clinic, which is Johns Hopkins COVID response clinic where we are mainly taking care of physicians and nurses, but certainly are open to all staff and get a broad range of referrals. And what I mean by that is certainly many of them are coming from my support, but also from colleagues, from people that they know in psychiatry, from their nurse managers, from their supervisors, from the RISE team going and rounding and being worried about someone. And so what we've done is have this very different uh, this very, as I said, complementary and multidisciplinary system that goes from services that are in person, the chaplains are on the wards, the RISE teams are on the wards, to others that are, you know, making it 
where individuals are making a decision to call my support and actually get particular support. <clears throat> but I want to go back to the issue of, of suicide. There are a number of reasons that we have, I think, concern that we may see rising suicide rates in the midst of this pandemic. One is that anytime there is economic crisis, there's a, typically an increase in the suicide rate. The other is the tremendous social isolation that everyone is facing. And I would say that healthcare workers and, and uh, particularly physicians and nurses have done that where they're trying to protect their families from themselves and their own risk of being ill. But then we also are changing the access to support and we're, I fear, about to go back into more of a lockdown situation where people will be there again. There have always been barriers to mental health treatment. We have started this new clinic, as I told you, to try to get around that, but there's always too much of a delay and not enough uh, services available as quickly as we'd like. And then also the medical problems that people are facing that I fear are going to get worse because many people are putting off care in the context of COVID because they're worried about what it means to go to the hospital. They're trying to do that. We also have, as I said, a general feeling of anxiety. There is a lot of anxiety around the election, around a number of other issues of civil um, unrest. And then finally, firearm sales. There's just recently an article talking about that and there is a known link uh, between increased firearm sales and, and suicide. So a number of things that make you worry about that. But then we just put a face on it. You know, Dr. Breen's death, I think, has many people very concerned that healthcare workers are in a different position and are under different stresses where they can be medically ill, psychiatrically ill, and then having enormous responsibilities that put them at risk of tragic deaths as she had. So let me just say a thing or two about uh, physicians as patients. I'd say in general, we're terrible. What I mean by that is that despite being in a system where they could easily have health care, only 35% of physicians have a regular source. In multiple screening studies, we see that very few medical students who screen positive for depression go forward and actually get services. And in another study, only 42% of medical students that had active suicidal ideation were getting treatment. And so you can absolutely have symptoms, even very severe symptoms, and not actually seek the care you need. And why is that? All kinds of reasons. But right now in COVID, I would say feeling that people don't have the time or the energy is a major hurdle that we still have to help people get past. And then there are all the things related to stigma that are also a part of this. I want to end with an image that was developed by a doctor, Sang, who is an ICU physician. I do not know him, but he's published this image, which I think captures everything well. We had our first wave where the deaths were actually coming from COVID-19. And we're having these other ways where people are putting off care. But the psychological consequences for everyone, and I think particularly for healthcare workers, is going to be growing and growing with time. And it is probably going to be six to 12 months after we have a vaccine and a sense of control of the virus itself that I think we're going to see peaks in the need for supportive care. And when people have the time to actually look back at what they have survived to go forward. So there are going to be serious psychiatric and psychological consequences for healthcare workers. I think that PTSD, depression, anxiety will be likely some of the most serious, and certainly suicide is a real risk. And so I urge healthcare organizations to facilitate evaluation and treatment with particular focus to those working on the front line, because as many people have said to me, look, we might be in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And I think some of our colleagues are absolutely taking a much greater brunt of the stress that we're facing. Excellent. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, let me turn it over to Dr. Rushton. Great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today and to represent uh, the nursing profession, the 4 million nurses in this country who are providing care. And um, ironically, in the midst of the 
2020 International Year of the Nurse and Midwife. Uh, this has certainly not been the uh, year that we had imagined. Uh, and as Dr. Schwartz pointed out, nurses are in the position where uh, many of them for 12 hours a day are dealing with the realities of the COVID pandemic. So what I wanna do for just a few moments is, is to actually put a human face on that story and invite you to walk with me uh, in the shoes of a nurse uh, facing these COVID challenges. So imagine you're a nurse who is a veteran nurse, 12 years of experience in, in critical care. You're working in a busy critical care unit in a city where the cases of COVID are increasing every single day. Black and brown people are arriving sicker than um, others and many of them because they waited too long to come and seek treatment. Maybe they were afraid to come to the hospital or maybe they weren't uh, allowed access for testing or treatment. Um, or others who believe that the COVID virus is just a hoax and they arrive in our emergency room in very serious condition. Probably worked four days in a row, most likely uh, 14 hours by the time you do your documentation on the diet of coffee and uh, probably protein bars. And you're so exhausted by the time you get home, there's not much energy to cook anything either. So it's a microwave um, dinner. At the end of your shift, you put your shoes and your scrubs in a plastic bag. And if you're lucky, you have a locker to leave that at the hospital. And on the ride home, your mind wanders to all the things that you believe you left undone. The heaviness of wondering whether anything you did that day actually made a difference and whether you might be risking your family's health by continuing to go to and from work. You're worried about whether your PPE actually is working and whether you're gonna get sick or when you're gonna get sick. When you arrive home, it's the new COVID ritual. You go immediately to the shower to try to rinse off the residue of the day. And as you find yourself in the shower, the tears start to fall. And you begin to remember the patients that you took care of that day, the ones who benefited and the ones who died often without their family members. You've hardly seen your husband or your kids for days on end. They're trying to be supportive, but they too are really worried about you and your health. You foist your exhausted body into bed and wake up again at 5 a.m. to start all over again. You grab your cup of coffee, you get in the car, and on the way to work, you wonder why are people not taking this pandemic seriously? You recall the man you took care of yesterday who lamented, I regret I didn't take this seriously. I didn't think the pandemic was real as you help with inserting his breathing tube. And you notice a swell of anger as you remember his fearful face and the images of people without masks in bars and restaurants in your city. When you arrive at the hospital, you learn that overnight the number of patients admitted has reached capacity and the supply of ventilators is critically low. The triage team plan has been implemented and two more nurses have tested positive to COVID and it means you're gonna work short again. You've now been assigned a new patient, a 67 year old woman who's been diagnosed with COVID who's having worsening respiratory distress. She's more unstable. She's a teacher. She's got two daughters the same age as you. You put on your PPE, your PAPR, you put on your mask and gloves and you go into her room and greet her and start doing a head to toe assessment where you realize that she's deteriorating. You notice that blue hue around her mouth that indicates she's not getting enough oxygen. Her chest heaves with each breath and her rate is very labored and fast. She's getting oxygen and all the medicines that are available, but she really needs a breathing tube and a breathing machine. But the triage officer has just informed you that there are no more ventilators. 
and that they're going to try to manage her without the machine. Typically at this point, you'd be asking her what her preferences were for her treatment. You'd be talking to her family members about what was the right decision for her, but they're not there because there are no visitors because of the high risk of transmission. So you're left with the weight of knowing what you should do, but not being able to do it because the resources you need are just not available. She looks into your eyes as you begin to um, leave the room. And she, in a very rasping voice says, tell my daughters, I love them. You feel this pit in your stomach as you try to reassure her that everything's going to be okay, but you feel this, the words you're saying are just hollow because you've had this situation several times already this week. You walk out of the room and your eyes meet the eyes of the other nurses in the hallway. Everyone has the same pained look on their face. You feel like you're abandoning your patient at a time of greatest need and you hesitate to even ask for help because you know everyone else is also overwhelmed. Seven hours later, you are calling her daughters after she becomes unstable. And you may be having a conversation like this. Um, so, so do you, can we, what, what do you think? In and out. Your girls are on the telephone, Joyce. Joyce? You can say something. She can hear you now. Hi, Mom. Hey, Mom. How are you doing? The girls say hi, Joyce. Your mom moved her fingers like she's waving. I, I, wish, I wish we could be there with you, Mom. They say they want to be here with you, Joyce. She knows that we can't, right? They can't because of the COVID. We love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. Your girls love you, Joyce. She nodded again a little. So, Dr. Schwartz has, has sort of put a light on the burdens that clinicians carry. And I think along with the physical, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion that many of them are experiencing, they're also experiencing moral suffering. And that's different from burnout. Um, moral distress is that experience that arises when we know what we ought to do, but we're unable to act on it because there are some kind of constraints. And in, in the pandemic, there are lots of constraints largely out of our control. It's not a new phenomenon in healthcare. We've been studying it for three decades. But what is new is the rapidly accumulating moral residue that accompanies these unresolved moral distress. This moral residue uh, really arises from the unmet obligations that persist even when you do the best you can in a really hard situation. And it often provokes feelings of shame and guilt and regret and a kind of moral failing. What we know about it is that it accumulates over time and it can contribute to things like burnout that occupational uh, sort of experience where we ex we feel exhausted and depleted, a kind of cynicism and lack of um, accomplishment occurs. We also know that there are more extreme forms of moral suffering, often referred to as moral injury, where our own actions or the actions of other violate a clinician's moral core in ways that really shatter their identity their self-esteem and their integrity. They are often more recalcitrant and more corrosive because in many situations they are associated with betrayals, often betrayals of people who are in power, leaders, the government, in high stakes situations like what we're experiencing in the pandemic. Many clinicians talk about feeling betrayed by the lack of resources such as PPE, for that would allow them to actually do their job safely. And often what happens in these situations is that 
as Dr. Schwartz described in this pandemic response, we may not actually have a moment to pause to realize that our conscience and our integrity has been violated or that our resources to respond to these situations has been depleted and our health and well-being has been really eroded. So these are the kinds of situations that sometimes fuel anger and outrage on the part of clinicians and understandably so because these are really threats to our sense of who we are. And it can really result in, I think, um, a kind of residue that, that needs to be accurately diagnosed. Uh, it's probably related to all the things we've heard so far. But the solution to how we deal with this um, has to be specific to the kind of wound that clinicians are experiencing. They lack sometimes a sense of making uh, sense out of themselves as healers, as good doctors and good nurses. Uh, they don't want to be considered heroes in these circumstances, but they do want to be able to do their job safely. So we already know that um, clinicians have um, already been experiencing high levels of burnout, um, as Dr. Schwartz already pointed to, but we also know that, that they're experiencing moral distress and moral injury. And as we heard, frontline workers are more uh, vulnerable to PTSD. What I also wanna highlight here is the impact on the healthcare system. What we know about the nursing profession is that um, there are already high levels of um, turnover in the nursing profession. What's concerning is that nurses who have just been trained, 17.5% are leaving after one year before COVID. As someone who teaches those young uh, nurses in our profession, it's heartbreaking to think about the, the loss of that level of expertise and competence. In a study of, during COVID, a national sample 67% of nurses were planning to leave their jobs. I want you to just pause on that. Two thirds of nurses planning to lose their, leave their jobs. We already had shortages that were predicted through uh, 2030. But if you put that in the context of uh, half a million seasoned nurses are anticipated to retire by 2022, that's not very long from now, um, we are going to be in some very serious shortages of, of healthcare professionals, and especially nurses. So I just want to offer a few thoughts about what we can do about this, and then I want to talk about what journalists might be able to do to help us with these issues. Uh, we have the pr uh, privilege of creating a uh, project in early in COVID called the Frontline Wiki Wisdom Forum, where we invited nurses from across the country to share their experiences and also to suggest solutions to the kinds of gaps that have arisen in our healthcare system. This pandemic has really revealed the fissures in our healthcare system. And their um, advice is actually pretty simple. Listen to frontline nurses. They know the answers. They know how to fix some of the problems that um, they encounter on a regular basis. They want their voices to be heard and understood and taken seriously. They want to be able to do their job safely. They want to be protected and having the right kind of equipment and having the right kind of guidance to make sure that they can do their jobs well. They also want to be empowered to be able to make changes at the point of care in the ways that are congruent with both their values, but also their expertise. So I would encourage you to take a look at this report. There's 14 recommendations focusing on both individuals and in a more systemic approach, including having stockpiles of those kinds of resources, as well as having a, a national nurse corps. Another uh, resource for how to approach this from a systems perspective are the recommendations that came out of our National Academy's report, Taking Action Against Clinician Burnout. I happen to have the privilege of being a part of that committee. 
and also to look at how those recommendations about creating uh, systemic approaches that re uh, address the issues within our healthcare systems, within our learning environments, removing the impediments to uh, regulations and uh, the burden of electronic medical records, as well as the um, access to mental health services. So I want to I want to just end by inviting you as a group of um, journalists to be a partner with us in addressing these issues. The first thing I'd like to propose to you is that nurses um, have been identified as the most trusted profession for almost 20 years every year, and that suggests that nurses are a credible source of information. So when you're doing a, 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 some kind of report that involves health, I would propose to you that if you have not talked to a nurse, you have an incomplete story. And the reason that nursing perspective is so important is because in many ways, um, when you uh, think about where nurses are in the healthcare system, if you want to know what the impact of policies are, in reality, ask a nurse because they'll be able to tell you how the policy gets implemented and what it actually uh, accomplishes and the unintended consequences that may go along with it. Um, somebody said recently, listening to nurses is like putting your finger on the pulse of healthcare itself. Second of all is to really think about um, nurses are uh, often cast as handmaidens. And in fact, nurses are very highly trained clinicians. They're scientists, they're innovators, educators, advocates, and system engineers to a large extent. And so they bring incredible expertise. Another thing that you're, as a, as a journalist, can help with is changing the narrative. And part of the changing of the narrative is that clinician suffering is a public health crisis and we should treat it as such. It is no longer um, possible to deny the incredible impact of these issues on our workforce. Denial is not a sustainable strategy any longer. And we have got to really all hands on deck to preserve the workforce we have and to create the opportunity to uh, have sufficient workforce in the future. Our healthcare system is unsustainable without a healthy workforce. And we need to uh, really call that out. Secondly, burnout has become kind of an overused, overgeneralized term. And I would propose that we need to be um, clear that that's only a partial story and we need to actually more accurately define what the problem is, to diagnose what it is that we're, we're seeing and the many multi-dimensions of it, instead of using a single term to accommodate, accommodate all of that. I would also suggest that um, you can have an important role in shifting the narrative about heroes and focusing on um, heroes and healers, as opposed to reinforcing what many clinicians find objectionable as being cast as heroes. They often don't feel like heroes. They say, it's just my job, and I want to be able to do my job. It's in our DNA. And when we hear those words and we feel like we can't do what we need to do, we often feel ashamed and guilty and um, inadequate in our failure to do what we know is right for our patients. The last thing I would say um, related to that is we've got to challenge the status quo and to really leverage systemic change. And I would invite you to consider covering the messy questions. Shine a light on the unspoken and the unacknowledged. Name the sources of our moral suffering and its consequences. And go beyond the surface to the deeper story. 
There is a there is going to be a long tail of disillusionment here, and I I think six to nine months is is probably a short time. I think we're going to see these reverberations for many many years into the future. So I would invite us to take the long view and know that there is not a quick fix to this, but it's going to take all of us to begin to shift this narrative in a way that will actually create the conditions for clinicians to do their work in the way that they are trained and they're committed to. And I look forward to working with you to do that. Thank you, Cinda. That was terrific. Um, and now we're going to look at another group of healthcare workers that um, need additional focus. I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Liz, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Robert Espinoza, and I'm the Vice President of Policy at PHI. We are a national organization focused on strengthening the direct care workforce, um, and we do that in three ways. One is we do research and policy analysis to better understand who these workers are and the kinds of challenges that they're facing in different states around the country. We also design a range of workforce interventions that help employers like nursing homes, home care agencies, and others develop training, career advancement roles, et cetera, that help support these workers and optimize the delivery of care um, in our long-term care system. Um, the third is that we um, educate the public and advocate for policy reforms that can help strengthen these jobs um, and improve care for everyone. The philosophy of our work is that caring, committed relationships between direct care workers and their clients are at the heart of quality care. And those relationships work best when direct care workers receive high quality training, living wages, and respect for the central role they play. Um, who are these workers? There are about 4.6 million home care workers, residential care aides, and nursing assistants who primarily provide support to older adults and people with disabilities in a variety of settings. Uh, they work in private homes, in nursing homes, and in residential care settings such as assisted living. They are often considered the paid frontline of support for older adults and people with disabilities, and they work closely with family caregivers and with all of the members of the interdisciplinary care team to ensure that all of us have the supports that we need. Um, this is a workforce that is rapidly growing because every year there are more people that turn 65 and increased longevity is creating growing demand for these workers. Um, we know that between 2018 and 2028, the long-term care sector will need to fill about 8.2 million job openings in direct care. Um, several of these jobs, a large percentage of these jobs, um, are new jobs that are being created to meet growing demand, all the people who need these workers. But a large percentage are actually workers who are leaving these jobs because they are so poor in quality and often leaving for other sectors like retail or fast food. There's also a percentage who exit the labor force, who retire, or for other reasons exit the labor force. Um, in 2019, direct care workers as a whole outnumbered every single U.S. occupation, which gives you a sense of the growing scale and the size of this, of this workforce. Um, the vast majority of direct care workers are women, about 87%. 59% um, are people of color. 27% um, are immigrants, and the median age is about 43. That said, it should be noted that about one in four direct care workers is about aged 55 and older, which means that we're also seeing a rapidly aging workforce taking care of a rapidly aging population. And what are the implications of that? Direct care jobs do not pay nearly enough. The median hourly wage is about $12.80, but adjusted for inflation, this wage has only increased by about 19 cents from 2009 to 2019. About 31% of workers part -time, work part-time, um, primarily because their employers relegate them to part-time work, but also because the economy doesn't necessarily sustain it. Um, the median personal earnings for these workers is around $20,000 per year. And because of all of this, about 45% of workers live in or near poverty. Of course, this means that they're not able to make ends meet, but also they increasingly rely on public assistance in order to survive. Um, these workers also struggle with the training landscape. The training standards for these workers are insufficient. They vary really by state, by occupation, and by setting, which makes it difficult uh, for these workers 
to move from one setting to another. Um, during COVID-19, we heard stories, for example, of doctors who were flying in from other states to affected states to basically support people who needed those doctors. That would not have been a reality for direct care workers because they, the training requirements vary by state and it's simply not portable. Um, the standards are especially low for personal care aides, which is the segment of this workforce that does not handle clinical tasks like you know, support with medications or blood pressure readings, and also for direct support professionals, which is the segment that supports people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we also see in general a lack of specialty training. This is training that's related to key topics like dementia care or LGBT competence, um, COVID-19, all of those topics that aren't necessarily considered core competencies, but are increasingly important considering how this population is aging and growing. Um, also, we know that our experience with most training programs around the country is that off they often don't account for adult learner-centered styles and also different learning styles. Um, so many of these programs aren't taking into consideration the variety of needs that people have as they learn. And there are very few career paths for direct care workers in most states, which means that they really see this as a job, uh, typically a temporary job because it doesn't pay enough, but not really an opportunity to advance um, in their careers. Um, there is very little data at the state level that allows us to understand turnover in the sector. States usually don't collect data on staffing, like full-time workers or part-time workers. They don't collect data on vacancy rates or turnover rates or compensation. Um, what we know is that studies that have looked at this um, typically report a turnover rate that hovers around 60 to 80 percent and typically within the first 90 days. And when you ask workers themselves for the top reasons they leave these jobs, typically the top two reasons are low wages and poor supervisors. Too often supervisors enter these roles without the proper training and support and workers, of course, aren't able to work under those conditions. Um, increasingly, especially in a time where workers have more job options, which is what we were seeing before COVID-19, um, the long-term care sector competes with retail and fast food employers for the same candidates. And they're actually able to offer higher wages, better jobs, more benefits, et cetera, which means that employers in this sector are struggling even more to find and keep these workers. Um, the COVID-19 crisis has really amplified and reinforced all of these challenges. Um, what I'm speaking to will be um, from a report that I authored in October of this year. Um, I believe it was shared with all of you. It's called, Would You Stay? Rethinking Direct Care Job Quality. And it covers the ways in which these jobs have really suffered from poor job quality for decades. And COVID-19 simply reinforced and amplified that. Of course, the detriment of both consumers and workers. Um, it also proposes a new framework for how do you improve these jobs across multiple dimensions. Um, what we know is that as of October 1st, the New York Times reported that there were more than 7.2 million COVID-19 cases uh, in the U.S. and about more than 207,000 people had died. Of course, this is in early October. We know that the virus is surging and these numbers have also multiplied. Um, as of the week of September 20th, about 318,000 nursing home staff not just nursing assistants, have had suspected or diagnosed cases of COVID-19, and approximately 900 nursing assistants have died. We assume these numbers have increased since September 20th. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough data on the home care sector to get a sense of how home care workers and workers in residential settings are being similarly um, impacted by the virus. We can assume that it's comparable in many ways, though it would be helpful to have better data on this, this workforce. Um, a recent study um, estimated that the number of direct care workers dropped by 280,000 during the first three months of COVID-19, and that home care workers accounted for the majority of that drop. So this workforce has contracted just in this year. Um, it doesn't surprise us. We heard numerous stories from workers and employers that were saying workers are, you know, are being forced to make the impossible choice of going to work, knowing that they won't be protected, they won't have supplies, they fear risking infection and infecting their families, and then they don't, and, and all for $12 an hour, right, without paid leave or access to the supports. So many workers, as this data shows, actually left the sector, and it'll be, it'll be interesting for us to see um, how those trends change over time. Um, we say that the, one of the challenges we saw with direct care workers, and we've seen that predates the virus, 
is that they were deemed essential from the very beginning, but they were continuously undervalued. They were not included in most mainstream telethons. Um, many of their workers and employers reported not having enough access to PPE, to supplies and other resources, especially in the home care sector, which is more scattered and less regulated. Um, workers often had inadequate compensation, though a handful of states did pass hazard pay measures that improved their wages modestly. Most of those measures have expired, by the way. Um, we saw some emergency leave measures or improvements in health coverage, access to child care supports for essential workers. All of those, in our, in, as, as far as we know, most of those have expired at the state level, and these workers are back to being unprotected and unsupported. Um, we also saw many employers struggling with training. If workers were leaving the sector, how do we bring new workers in and how do we train them knowing that most training programs are in person and pose risk? And those that exist virtually have not been, and for the most part, you know, properly evaluated or sanctioned by state policymakers um, to really work and bring new workers into the pipeline. Um, also training on COVID-19 was largely happening sporadically. So people were developing training, COVID-19 training based on their available understanding of the science or what was being put out by um, experts. Um, and yet most of that COVID-19 training, in, as far as we know, was not properly evaluated. Um, and what's really needed is training on infection control and prevention that goes above and beyond COVID-19. Um, we saw a lot of temporary measures um, for example, a measure, a waiver administered by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that allowed the hiring of temporary nursing assistants who were able to bypass the 75 hours of federal training requirements to offer emergency support. This raises incredible questions for us. What does it mean to bypass 75 hours? Are they properly trained and supported? What will happen to these workers when the emergency order expires? Um, and what are the ways in which we can take advantage of you know, a, a supply of workers who have developed you know, incredible skill and knowledge on the job, but also ensure that they get the training they need to fill in any gaps. I, I think this has always been a challenge in emergency moments, the challenge, the tension between emergency temporary measures and what's needed in the long term. And finally, because of limited data collection, we weren't able to tell at the state level where hotspots were emerging and where we, we were able to tell where hotspots were emerging, but not where there were available workers. So we weren't able to say if a hotspot emerged in a certain part of the state, we might be able to draw from workers from other states. And that's a, a major challenge for the sector and an example of how poor data collection limits our understanding. Um, since I'm speaking to a group of journalists and people who are shifting the narrative and shaping the narrative, um, I do want to offer a few thoughts about what we've seen at PHI in regards to this workforce and the public narrative. Um, first of all, I think w when we take a step back and we think about the trends that are shaping the sector, um, I think some of my colleagues would agree with me on this and many of you who have covered healthcare might also agree with this. Um, one is that it's important to remember that we are in a moment of growing and changing demographics and profound inequality, that we're seeing a rising increase um, in the number of people of color, number of immigrants. We're seeing in the aging sector, the first generation of LGBT people to age openly and out in these settings. Um, we're seeing uh, an incredible, we're seeing kind of a, a larger population in these settings dealing with acute um, concerns and uh, dementia, for example, is on the rise. But with all of that, there are also disparities. And so how do we balance the reality that we're a diverse country, but we're also a deeply unequal country? Um, the second is that the future of healthcare is team-based and interdisciplinary, and that increasingly we must think of, in the context of direct care, as these workers as part of a constellation of healthcare supports that older adults and people with disabilities rely on. And how do we create systems where that constellation is interacting with each other and really providing us the level of support we need? Um, the third, I think, comes really out of the disability rights field, which is that people have non-medical needs and broader aspirations. They don't just need access to medications and diagnoses and treatments. They, they often have aspirations about how they want to live their lives and how they want to address their full health. 
Um, and I think that's especially true with direct care workers and the role that they play in the system. And that people are part of complex systems and larger communities. I mentioned that a significant percentage of direct care workers are immigrants. And to support these workers means understanding the kinds of immigrant related barriers that they're facing, especially in an era where anti-immigrant bias is on the, is on the, on the rise. Um, I think some of the common misconceptions are that direct care work is low skilled or unskilled, that people often see low wages and assume that there's something low skilled about that. The reality is the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine has said that these workers should undergo at least 120 hours of training to do this work. And anybody who's ever been a direct care worker or an employer knows that it takes incredible labor and skill, emotional, physical, and communications related skills to do this work. And so too often we, we frame these workers as low skilled simply because we're, they're low wage. Um, I do see that there's a media fascination with what we might call bad apples or catastrophes. When I first started at PHI five years ago, um, almost every story that I saw in direct care worker involved the story of a home care worker who was hired by a consumer who came into the person's home, who robbed them, who abused them, who assaulted them, and then they were you know, taken to jail. And those stories were often paired with mugshots, typically of women of color. Um, the, no one denies the reality of these stories or the incredible hurt and harm that they cause on people. But there's something to be said about what does it mean when coverage is only looking at those lone examples of workers as threats and also the racism of mugshots. I think there's been growing interest among journalists about what it means to put those images forward. Um, there is less po focus these days on new populations for these workers. Um, the, prim the majority of these workers are women, people of color, and immigrants. And yet we need a much stronger and diverse workforce to meet growing demand. So we need more stories of men in direct care, younger workers, millennials, but also the older population, which might bring rich experience from their own family experiences into these jobs. And we need more coverage on the systemic roots of these challenges and on solutions. Um, during COVID-19, when it first emerged, um, I, I, heard, I spoke with a number of reporters who wanted to write stories about the threat that nursing assistants pose to residents because they had more than one job and they must be kind of incredible vectors of transmission. What's, what's missing from that analysis is that most nursing assistants have multiple jobs because their jobs pay $12 an hour and it's the only way in which um, they can make ends meet. Um, um, this is a framework we released last month that shows what it takes to improve jobs in this sector. You can see the five pillars from training to compensation, supervision and support, respect and recognition, real opportunity. All of this is detailed in the report that I shared with you, but you can see the elements of these pillars, that training is accessible and affordable and relevant, or that programs account for the cultural, linguistic, and learning differences of workers who enter this sector. Um, also, I think we're seeing an increase in wage measures that can improve wagers, wages for workers, um, and that can also offer financial literacy and counseling programs for these workers. And we advocate for solutions that can standardize training across all occupations, across all its states, so they can be, these jobs can be more portable. We need stronger training programs, more money, including e-learning modules that might help people learn from home about how, what it takes to do these work, this work. And also implementing advanced roles. How do we better integrate these workers and create care coordination models where workers can really coordinate care across physicians and social workers and family members. We need more data, more infrastructure at the state level. Perhaps these measures can help centralize training and certification records. And we need more original studies and more news stories on the direct care workforce on any and all of the topics that I talked about um, over the last 20 minutes. Um, I'll close by saying that all of this information is available on our website at phinational.org. We also run the National Direct Care Workforce Resource Center, um, which was established by a federal grant. And it's basically every major resource um, that's been produced in the field on these workers. It's available on our website. And we have the Direct Care Worker Story Project, where we've been interviewing workers from around the country to tell the stories in their own words. Finally, you can follow us on social media at PHI National. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to our conversation. Well, thank you very much, Robert. That was uh, really good and really important points to make. Um, as a reminder, please 
uh, type your questions in and I'll read them to our panelists and they will also be available in the breakout rooms following our discussion in about half an hour. Um, I wanted to uh, start off by asking all of you to briefly comment on how the incoming Biden-Harris administration might affect the various workforce issues that um, you all touched on, whether that's staffing, whether that's wages, whether that's PPE, whether that's mental health support and services. Um, what do you think the changes are going to be ha you know, coming down the pike? Let's start with Dr. Swartz. I'm hopeful, but not sure. And what I mean by that is just the fact that I have hope that science will take a much more central role in policy, I think will go a long way. I think as far as mental health, there's every reason to believe from, you know, their positions they've had before that they're going to be supportive of recognizing the importance of mental health and hopefully supportive of legislation, but also funding. I mean, that's a big issue. There's an enormous equity issue in people getting all kinds of services. And my hope is with protecting healthcare, with making healthcare more broadly available, that we're going to be able to reach out. I mean, I think that um, Dr. Russian made so many important points about moral injury, but it is a devastating experience to know people need care and watch them drop out of it because of their lack of healthcare uh, coverage. And so I'm gonna be hopeful. Dr. Rushton? Well, I'm always hopeful, <laughs> but I'm also a realist. And I, um, I think it's a great opportunity for us to use the unrest and the um, uh, conflict that we've all experienced, the challenges of trying to think about what health means in our country um, and to use this momentum to take seriously those challenges, uh, the inequities, uh, the ways in which healthcare is um, so, uh, you know, uh, influenced by structural injustices uh, shows up every single day. So I hope that we're going to leverage that, that opportunity. I also am hopeful that um, President Biden will include nurses on his coronavirus task force. Currently, there are none represented, but I think that that's a voice that um, would be very important in trying to think about how to turn this uh, pandemic around by having that perspective. And I also think that um, it may be an opportunity for us to think about the social determinants of health and how they um, are not separate from how we think about health as sort of an isolated um, context, but rather is influenced by all of these other important areas of our lives and um, to hopefully restore some of the safety nets that have been dismantled over the last four years for people um, uh, who are most vulnerable, people of color, and those who are in most need of health care. Robert, what do you think the incoming administration will do. Well, first, I would say ditto to all of those ideas, um, and I like the word hopeful. Um, in this summer, President-elect Biden issued a plan on the caregiving workforce, where he outlined a number of measures that I hope um, will be um, implemented. One is that he argued for increasing compensation for direct care workers and increasing the funding that goes into that compensation. Um, he argued for expanding home and community-based services, which if we did so would also strengthen the home care workforce in particular. Um, and he also argued for an innovation fund that would fund innovations in the sector. And that could, that could support um, interventions for direct care workers as well. I'm hopeful also that the COVID-19 task force includes more aging and long-term care experts and workforce experts because they're a big part of that strategy. And I'm hopeful that they'll address uh, many of the points that I covered in my presentation, improving training, um, improving data collection, career advancement, um, and also a social insurance program that can make long-term care more affordable to all of us. Terrific. Um, 
They have a question about, uh, with the recent vaccine news, there's been some discussion about resistance among a segment of healthcare workers in accepting vaccinations. Are there any preemptive efforts underway to reduce those concerns? I don't know who wants to take that one. Um, I'll start and maybe my fellow panelists can jump in. Um, I think there are two, for me, there are two major pieces to that that we should begin to think about. One is more understanding on the reasons why workers might be resistant. Um, is it that they don't trust the science? Is it that, that they're afraid of kind of the underlying conditions that they might be dealing with? Um, is it that, you know, they didn't trust the current administration, but they might trust the new administration? The, the state measures, I mean, there must be a range of barriers that are behind that resistance. Um, and I think it starts by better understanding what those barriers are. Um, and then I think for all of us, not just essential workers, um, I think we need to be guaranteed that the vaccines um, have gone through every single possible safety precaution um, and that they're being implemented in a way that is equitable, that reaches the right people first, um, and that we're keeping track of anything that comes up along the way. Um, for me, those are two initial steps. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in? Well, I, I think there are a lot of people thinking about this issue right now. The National Academies, uh, our colleagues at Johns Hopkins have also been creating uh, frameworks for how to allocate those um, vaccines once they're available. But I think these issues around trust and trustworthiness, uh, as Robert has pointed out, are, are really important for us to understand where the resistance is coming from. One group in particular are people of color who distrust science and research. And um, there's, a, there's an interesting um, tension because there are some uh, frameworks that prioritize people who have been disproportionately uh, affected by the pandemic as the first wave of people who will get the um, vaccine. And that also in a you know, sort of counterintuitive way in some instances, they're worried that that may suggest that they're being, um, you know, experimented with because we don't have the long-term um, safety efficacy data yet. That said, I think that there's a lot that's going on to um, reassure people about the process that actually is necessary for approval for these um, vaccines in the United States to be used and my colleagues um, have been quite reassuring that that, that process is a, one that is being followed very closely. I'd like to just echo that. What I've heard is that if we can disconnect politics from the science, the people will feel better about it. I think there has been concern, I've shared concern, that there has been a push to achieve something as part of a political plan which is I would like to achieve a vaccine for a medical reason, for a protection reason, for a scientific reason. And I believe that our colleagues at um, CDC and other places are working hard to actually have those standards. And I, I think the reassurance, you know, I believe it was uh, Kamala Harris who said, when Dr. Fauci tells me to take the vaccine, I'll do it. I, I echo that too. When trusted science leaders are telling us that they believe the safety threshold has been met and that they think that this is an effective and safe vaccine, I think that will be there. I also share Dr. Rushton's concern that in a desire to try to reach the people who might benefit most from the vaccine, that we might, we might need to have a whole nother group do it and be part of the first wave to take it safely. And I imagine that all manner of healthcare workers are gonna be part of that, where, Again, if you look at risk benefit, you know, I work in the hospital and I will be happy when there's a safe vaccine available for myself and all my colleagues. And so we might end up being in that way, the guinea pigs. And I think that's appropriate because I think we have a different risk benefit and other workers in other areas do too. And so perhaps that will give enough safety data to allow other members of our community to say, okay, if they're doing it, and we now have X months where there haven't been bad consequences, then we can go forward. Yeah, just um, as, a, as a reminder to anybody that missed 
uh, Francis Collins' keynote interview earlier today, uh, he also uh, was emphatic that the uh, distribution and approval of vaccines will be based on science and not politics. So, um, I, you know, get, uh, as journalists, getting that message out there to whoever the audience is is, is important. Um, have, there's a question here for Cinda. Uh, um, as a nurse myself, I know that nurses tend to blend into the background and not be out front for media or to be spe or to be on a speaking list like physicians. How do journalists find the floor or unit nurses to speak with, or how can we convince, and this is something uh, myself and many of my colleagues have run into, you call the public relations department or the community relations people, and they immediately will go to the chief of department or you know, uh, somebody, no offense, that's sort of somebody with an MD after their name, rather than um, perhaps somebody that's actually on the floor doing the hands-on day-to-day care. So how can journalists, kind of foster that that relationship with getting more uh, nurses' voices out there. And by the same token, uh, Robert, maybe you want to chime in too about, I know a lot of uh, particularly nursing homes have policies of, of not allowing the direct care workers to speak with the media. So how do we find these people? Well, I think uh, you need to um, ask more questions. So when you are provided one option as someone to speak with, I would suggest that you ask specifically to speak to a nurse. And um, secondly, I think to uh, that may work in a healthcare institution, look to schools of nursing. Um, they often have communications um, offices just like schools of medicine do, and they can be really helpful in putting you in contact with um, faculty. But, you know, a person like myself, I spend a good bit of my time in the, in the hospital environment. And um, I think part of the challenge with getting the voices of frontline nurses is they're worried about retribution and um, having their jobs to be in some ways threatened. So to me, that suggests we need to have proper protections for people to speak about these issues honestly and openly and accurately. And I think part of that is um, people benefit from some training about how to have those kinds of conversations. And that needs to be a reciprocal bi-directional process of um, you know, journalists working with us to create the, the pathways so that more nurses can actually speak about these issues. And I know personally, I'm happy and have connected um, people with frontline clinicians who um, have shared their experiences, but they also want to have trust that you're going to communicate their stories accurately and in uh, alignment with um, their experience. And so this is a process, I think, of building trust on both sides. Yeah, I, w I would ditto all of that. I mean, I think that in the direct care sector, it starts with speaking, you know, directly with the nursing home, with the home care agency, the assisted living facilities. I mean, it varies in terms of how strict they are uh, in granting access to workers for reporter interviews. Um, I do think it's important to set the tone from the very beginning about how their story will be shared. Um, some workers want to be more anonymous if they're going into more detail. Um, and also there are a number of organizations in different states and at the national level who work directly with workers um, or who have access to workers um, who have already been screened and, you know, and, are, and, and those organizations can help connect journalists to those workers. So if you're not able to get in the front door with a direct care employer, um, maybe go through an organization as well. Yep. Great. Um, so we recently had a, a report, I believe it was out of North Dakota, um, where the situation of the shortages was so dire in, in workforce that the governor um, was encouraging COVID positive physicians and nurses and, and, and direct care workers to come to work, even if they were positive, as long as they were asymptomatic. Um, after my jaw finished dropping, um, um, I just, I was speechless. I don't know. Uh, can, can you all comment on that approach? 
and what what we should be doing to counter that maybe? Well, there hasn't been a lot of science driving policy in North Dakota. So I'm not, I, I think that's the concern. And I also think the concern is this, um, you know, the, this is a, a problem. Obviously, we have an enormous ethical responsibility to not get our colleagues sick and not get our patients sick. And I think that we have to think of other ways to do it. I think the problem is we are now at the point, I mean, they're at a point that we're hoping to all avoid. The, a different way to look at it, because I can't even make sense of that. Uh, the different way to look at it relates around redeployment. And for example, I last worked in an ICU in 1991 when I was a medicine intern. No one wants me running the ICU. No one wants me doing anything in the ICU except maybe transport. And so the reality is, I think it gets to this issue of moral injury Dr. Rushton addressed, which is when you're asking people to do things that they know are wrong, but they know there's a crisis and they're wondering what will happen if they don't actually do the thing that they're uncomfortable with, that's a terrible position to be in. And unfortunately, I think that's where they are. If we have no one to take care of the patients, what will happen then? That, that is as awful as an asymptomatic person trying to decide if it's safe or not, if they have enough PPE on to go to work. Yeah, boy, talk about an ethical issue. And actually this just came up um, recently in trying to think about how do we weigh those risks? You know, and I, I think there's also a, a dimension here of if we are in a situation with this degree of constraint of resources, what are the um, what are the options that we put on the table to try to balance and meet those needs? Is it in fact the first thing we should think about is putting a person who is COVID positive back to work. And as Dr. Schwartz mentioned, you know, are there other options before we get there? And what are we trading off in the process? Because as, as we've talked about before, these are the kinds of examples where there's so much dissonance that's created for clinicians when they're asked to do something that they know the science does not support and yet somebody in uh, authority is saying, you need to do this. I wonder if another plea step in the process is first of all, to give those individuals the option of whether they are even willing to take that risk rather than mandating it to include an element of um, autonomy on the part of that clinician to decide if that is a, a risk that they are willing to take personally or not. And to not have it set up that the people who refuse or say no to that are somehow punished in some way. So I think, I think we've got some work to do to understand what are the things that are, uh, are ethically justified in putting on the table as the ways to address these shortages? And have they been exhausted before we come to those kinds of options? Mm -hmm. I think in the, in the direct care sector, um, you know, because so many workers don't have access to paid sick days or paid leave, they were inadvertently pressured to, to go to work, right? Because they, 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 they would be fired if they, they didn't go to work and they didn't have the paid sick days. Um, and so what does it mean that we don't offer that, that safety net to workers um, to take care of themselves and support them? And what does it mean for their health, the health of their employees, the health of residents, et cetera? Um, the other piece that it brings up for me is the importance of testing. I think that and if we're, I think if, if we're going to develop a stronger workforce, at least in the direct care context, um, that has the ability to move in and out of settings and, and without putting people at risk, we need stronger rapid results testing. And I think that that's going to be a big part that doesn't put people into these ethical dilemmas. No. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that struck me was back when this whole thing kind of came to its first head in, in March, there were a lot of uh, physicians and nurses and nurses aides that were coming to hotspots like New York um, 
and there was a way to move staff around the country and requirements were waived and, and so on. Now with, with uh, hotspots in basically 49 out of 50 states, we can't do that. So what kind of pressure does it put on the, the physician and nurse and direct care staff because they can't even think about maybe taking the day off. They'll come in on their days off. So what does that do to issues of burnout and, and mental health and just feeling like they're on, you know, this hamster wheel that's just, they're never getting off? So that, I think what you're pointing to is there are limits for every person and every system for what we're able to adapt to. And I think we are reaching a critical point in, in the ability for many clinicians to adapt to the changes and the uncertainty and the just exhaustion <clears throat> that has been created by the pandemic. And, and I think we have got to find other ways of um, supporting people by giving them time away. You cannot continue to work day after day after day with no break. You have to have spaces to pause and to renew and refresh. And so that has to happen at a structural level. And people, you know, nurses and doctors are always, you know, their, their commitment is to serve those who need it. But we cannot co-opt that commitment and expect the individuals to be responsible for solving these systemic problems. We can't put it on their backs to be the ones that only bear that burden. And so we've got to, to look beyond, um, you know, sort of the, the simple band-aids to something that is much more meaningful. And part of that is we need to ask people, what do you need to be able to feel like you can meet these challenges and that you can actually come to work another day what needs to be in place for that to happen? And we need to listen. I'd like to add, I completely agree. And I think the problem that we're going to see is that we're going to see people going and going and going until they are in terrible trouble. Either that they are medically ill, they're psychiatrically ill. I am very fearful that we'll see a rise. We already have a relatively high rate in death from suicide for physicians. And I think that we are at risk of our of the physicians and nurses that are working so hard just having fallout from this that is potentially tragic. In the direct care context, we don't talk enough about mental health issues uh, among direct care workers. Um, and we know that most direct care workers don't have access to grief support, to bereavement leave, um, and losing not just a family member, but a client can be emotionally devastating for many workers. And we've seen anecdotally stories of workers who leave the job when they lose a client and they can't deal with the trauma and the loss of it. Um, and so I can only imagine what um, their realities are right now, but more importantly, what the lack of support, um, what impact it's having on them. So. so that leads me to another question, which is what can or should state and local governments be doing to support these workforces and how are they falling short? We've got about five or six minutes left. I don't uh, we, we could probably do a whole panel on this. Who wants to start? <laughs> I'll start. Um, you know, in the direct care context, most uh, much of the direct care job is covered currently by Medicaid. Um, and I think, you know, as a, one important measure is we need to increase the level of Medicaid funding, um, reimbursement rates for providers, um, and specifically money that's dedicated to job quality supports, like higher wages, better training, uh, data collection, and so on. Um, I think until we address the financing and the financial pressures the state and federal governments are dealing with, it's hard to think about how we would improve these jobs. So this is not a this is not a solution by itself, but I think one of the things that state and local governments can do is to uh, create collaborations among healthcare organizations, as we've done in our state, in trying to come up with a statewide plan for how we can allocate our scarce resources in a way that 
uh, honors basic ethical principles of fairness and um, equity in terms of uh, how those resources are allocated across the state. And to think not about just our individual um, healthcare organizations, but to think of a broad, the broader community. And having those kinds of processes be systematic and similar across organizations is one way to reduce some of the dissonance and some of the conflicts that can occur in communities when there are different standards of how care is being delivered to certain people and how what the expectations are of different members of the healthcare workforce. So I think the more that we can create collaborative um, planning uh, proactively and in a way that, that acknowledges that there are uh, inequities but that we can address that more systematically may be one leverage point to support the front lines. I was just going to say that I also think there's been a lot of discussion about should we or should we not have special compensation for frontline healthcare workers. You know, there, there are a lot of people working at Johns Hopkins Hospital, but not everyone is in the ICU or on the COVID wards. And and I do think, and by that I mean the entire team that's there. And I think that we have to think about that and not to diminish anyone else's efforts or what others are doing, but maybe if it's, it may be that it's in extra time off or recognizing that personally, I would love to see protected time for people seeking support or if they feel that they need support to attend a support group, to be part of another health program, to get a psychiatric evaluation. I think paid time off for that would be a small way to do it that might not get quite to the inequities. It gets tricky because I think everyone's working very hard. Yeah. And I think that it is exhausting, no matter what your role is. I think it's exhausting for the leaders who aren't on the front lines anymore. I think it's exhausting for the students, the nursing students and the medical students who are limited in what they're allowed to do because we're trying to conserve PPE. I think it's exhausting for everyone. And so I would like to see some recognition that others need more and perhaps protecting time. And and I say that for everyone from the, you know, any any level of healthcare workers that we're seeing. One of the other challenges, um, you know, and we've we've talked a lot about kind of these big urban medical centers, Hopkins and, you know, the, the centers in New York City and so on. But there's also a real disparity between urban and rural health care. We know that a lot of these, the smaller hospitals have shut down. People may have to go 50, 75 miles. And we've, we've seen it in places like El Paso now where they're at capacity and they're sending people to New Mexico. How do we address the this other disparity of providing adequate nursing and, and direct care and, and physician support to people that may not be near a big medical center and don't have access to the kind of expertise that we've all been talking about? I think the problem is that we have enormous health care inequity in this country. And so when you talk urban rural, you're usually talking about poverty versus resource resource rich and resource poor areas, not exclusively, but fairly. I mean, it, it follows there. And so I think until we have a more adequate, comprehensive health care system for everyone, that it's going to be very hard to address these issues. Yeah, I think in the direct care context, um, we're seeing more of an interest in technology and telehealth as a way of making sure that people who live in rural areas um, have what they need. Um, but there are limitations. I mean, the vast majority of direct care and home care work is hands-on work. Um, and so technology can help supplement and support workers, but it can't replace them. Um, so I, I think it's a major question for us. Yep. Well, the, only, the only thing I would add, Liz, is um, I always go back to ask ask the experts who live in rural areas what they think the solutions are because I honestly have no idea living in a urban area in a academic medical center and I suspect they have a lot more wisdom than I would on that topic. Well, we have about a minute or a minute and a half left uh, before we go into the breakout rooms. 
I wanted to ask each of you if you could tell us maybe one or two story headlines you would like to see from health reporters that are covering these these issues of a strained workforce, what would that be? Round robin. Dr. Schwartz? Oh, um, you know what? I actually, I want to build on something that Dr. Rushton had said. I would like us to not have somehow to address, and I'm not writing a good headline for anyone, but here's a topic that we cannot expect physicians and nurses to be superheroes because then we don't allow them to ask for the help they need. Excellent. Dr. Rushton? Clinician suffering is a public health emergency. It's, a, it's an epidemic and it needs to be addressed uh, urgently. Absolutely. Robert? Um, I would say um, one headline might be why grief support matters for direct care workers. Um, and the other might be, we are running out of direct care workers. Okay. I've got another one. Who will care for you after COVID when there is no healthcare workforce? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a scary one. Um, something we don't even want to think about. Well, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for participating today. This was a really fascinating discussion. And I think you all touched on many points that um, were not only informative, but certainly things I hadn't thought about, you know, in the, in the bigger picture context. So um, now we're going to uh, go into breakout rooms and anybody else with questions would like to speak with any of our panelists one-on-one, -on -one, uh, feel free to join. And uh, thank you all. And um, we'll be providing the resources and links you sent us uh, as soon as possible, as soon as Jeff can get those posted online. No pressure, Jeff. Thanks a lot.